Well, I'll say good morning, because this is about when I wake up. Um, there's Boulder. Uh, I'm going to go fast. I'm not going uh, to talk about every slide. I want to leave some time for discussion, uh, both for my presentation and everybody. Um, this is an advertisement. Uh, if you want to know my broader views on climate, this is a wonderful gift for that special someone in your life. Um, I'm going to go quickly talk about um, a methodology that I and uh, Justin Ritchie and Matt Burgess, two close colleagues, uh, and have been working on for the last couple years um, to evaluate plausibility of IPCC scenarios. Um, let me say this is obviously not the only way to evaluate scenarios for plausibility, and it may not even be the best way, but it is a way, and we have uh, entered this discussion to try to motivate a broader discussion exactly like we're having here. So, so thanks to Alec and Jessica for uh, organizing this session. All right, you've seen this already, and I'm going to show a lot of slides that is cone-shaped. And one of the key questions is, how can we tell the difference between a scenario that is possible and a scenario that is plausible? Um, the IPCC uh, states explicitly that the scenarios it considers are plausible, but it does not give us uh, rigorous criteria for evaluating plausibility and does not itself take responsibility for doing that evaluation. Um, so that's a gap that needs to be filled in uh, the literature and in practice. Um, so, so here's an analogy. We're doing something very similar to what Working Group 1 has done with physical climate models. Um, they have looked at constrained model output um, based on how well it replicates temperature changes in the past. Um, those that can't replicate past temperature changes, it sets aside when it has done its projections for the future. We're doing something very similar. So our approach, um, we have multiple different screens that we use to evaluate scenarios. Um, I'm only going to talk about a few of them, um, but the, the key part is we have a screen that looks at the past. How well do scenarios uh, replicate emissions, uh, carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel and industry? Um, and then we have a forward-looking screen where we take the most recent scenarios, short-term scenarios of the IEA, um, it was 2040, uh, now they're out to 2050, and we say how well do the scenarios match up with the uh, carbon dioxide emissions from uh, these projections. Um, we use multiple accuracy, accuracy thresholds for annual growth rates, um, and we've looked at the scenarios of the AR5, and I'll show you today for the first time the scenarios um, of the AR6. So, so this figure, um, this is one of my favorite figures um, that, that I've had a chance to develop. This shows all of the AR5 scenarios, uh, 1,300 scenarios plus. Um, they're arrayed uh, based on temperature change on the vertical axis in 2100 and cumulative carbon dioxide emissions on the horizontal axis. And I put the, the red oval around it. This is the entire set of plausible scenarios that AR5 had in its database. How do we know that IPCC considered them plausible? They put them in the database by definition. So after we apply our screen, and I'm just going to show one of them here, what does the red oval look like? The bottom figure shows the, the scenarios that survive our screening. Um, so these are the scenarios that match up according to a quantitative threshold with past emissions and projected emissions to 2040, in this case, of the IEA. Um, it's a much smaller subset, and we would expect this. This is perfectly natural because most of the scenarios in the AR5 database are based on information as of 2005 or 2010. Um, scenarios get old, just like me, just like you, um, and they need to be refreshed every once in a while. Um, so here's some key points. Um, the high emission scenarios are clearly implausible, according to the screen. What's a high emission scenario? Um, anything over six watts per meter squared in this instance. Um, RCP 4.5 and the SSP2 4.5 are plausible high emission scenarios. I know in the literature they're often used to represent uh, mitigation success. Uh, today I think we can say based on this method that they are in fact uh, high end scenarios. Um, a, a business as usual or, or consistent with current policy scenario is a 3.4 watts per meter squared scenario. Um, I will say that scenario is almost never studied by anyone. All right, so um, you probably can't read this, but I, I want to make a few points here. One is um, on the upper left, it shows that the CMIP process, uh, 
both CMIP 5 and CMIP 6, prioritize the highest end scenario, the 8.5 watts per meter squared scenario. It is no surprise, based on that prioritization, this bottom table shows the most mentioned scenarios in the IPCC report are 8.5 watts per meter squared. And I've just made the case to you that, that those scenarios are implausible. So most of our attention in the IPCC reports and the literature that it accurately reflects is on scenarios that are not plausible according to this screen. Um, this is problematic. It may be good for advancing scientific understandings of climate change, but for informing policymakers and the public, um, this has created a bias in the literature and in the assessment process. So here's the results from uh, AR5 on the left. So the purple um, shading shows um, the, where the screen winds up for 2100, and you can see it's um, the highest uh, there are constant 2019 emissions. The median scenario there gets to net zero around 2100. On the right is the same analysis for um, the AR6, and it's uh, qualitatively substantially the same. The median scenario gets to net zero uh, about 2100, and the upper boundary is about constant 2019. Um, you can see the, the 7.0 and 8.5 lines above that that are well outside the, the cone. Um, another way to show that same data, so these are all of our screens, um, but I've circled the one on the left, which is the, the, the one that I showed in the figure um, with the 1% tolerance and using the IEA steps um, projection, all of the, the scenarios are between two and three degrees. So that's not policy success, that's not Paris, and it's not 1.5 degrees, but it's not four degrees and it's not five degrees either. Um, and here's the results for, um, for the AR6. Again, between two and three degrees. One thing I'll point out, if you go all the way to the right and you look at the APS, the announced policy scenario of IEA, um, those are actually in, uh, AR6 below two degrees. So this tells us uh, that according to the assumptions made by the people who produce these scenarios, if we were to follow the announced policies um, that have been stated by governments around the world, we would be on track for under two degrees. So we have a roadmap in front of us for what needs to be done. Um, we don't need fanciful inventions of technologies that don't exist. Um, we need countries to follow their commitments. This is good news. Um, one troubling finding is that many of the scenarios in the AR6 database are already not plausible. Most of them because they don't faithfully replicate the past. So scenarios have been put in the database which may have uses in scientific research, but which do not faithfully replicate the observed history of the energy systems. Um, again, that's problematic for policy. Now let me just take a brief moment to explain why is it that we have so many implausible scenarios. Um, so this is a cone. All right, I got a green card, that's good. I play soccer, so that's... that's um, this is a cone that shows um, CO2 emissions uh, to 2045, and all I want you to do is take a look at the the, the bottom curves here, which are the energy um, scenarios from the various energy institutions like EIA, BP, Exxon, IEA. And what you can see is that this is pre-pandemic. They, uh, by mid-century, they will be falling out of the range of projected CO2 emissions um, in the entire AR5 data set. So that means that the scenarios uh, did not envision the future that we are actually approaching. One reason for that, Coal energy, you already heard a bit about this. Um, this is from my colleague Justin Ritchie from a paper he did with Hadi Della Tabati, and it shows again for the entire AR5 database, so each line represents a curve representing future coal consumption, um, every single scenario in that database uh, projected an increase in coal consumption. The stars and the red line show, um, in fact, the real world is going in a different direction. So the assumptions of uh, learning by doing and ever increasing coal energy, eventually taking over our, our, our liquid fuels, replacing wind, replacing solar, replacing nuclear, apparently that is not uh, expected to happen anymore. That's good news. Uh, similar graph, this is per capita coal consumption. And 
the, the yellow or brown curve is SSP 5, 8.5. Um, compare that to the, the IEA projections from 2019. This is pre-pandemic. Um, the pandemic coal went down, it's come back up, but it will be very similar. When I say that uh, 8.5 uh, scenarios based on these emission trajectories are implausible, it's because that purple and black line are not the brown line. All right, so what? A few thoughts. Um, and then I'll wrap up. So, so scenarios are expected to be plausible. That's, that's not controversial. Um, however, implausible scenarios with no connection to the real world are prioritized and dominant in climate research and assessment. Um, no one has responsibility for evaluating scenarios for plausibility. Um, and I'll be provocative here. The, the needs and wants of the climate research community appear to overshadow the needs and wants of policy relevance. Um, and this is something uh, Justin and I documented in a 21,000 word paper. If you have insomnia or jet lag, it's good for that. Um, but I think that's also not particularly controversial. Um, right now, scenarios are, are widely and consequently misused by central banks in social cost of carbon uh, estimates. Um, and when extreme scenarios are used as business as usual in research and assessment. Um, our view of the climate future is arguably distorted today by scenarios more than being informed. And again, that's a problem. Let me end, I'm not gonna read this. Um, this is an optimistic observation. Um, if you were able to get into a time machine and go back to 2000 or 2005, and tell experts in the climate community where we would be in 2022 compared to where business as usual scenarios projected, it would be a very positive message and people would be actually quite happy to be where we're at today. Um, deep decarbonization is an enormous century long challenge, uh, but the world is much better positioned to do it uh, than we conventionally think. So a special thanks to Matt and Justin. There's a whole bunch of papers here. Um, I'll post these online later today. And thank you very much. Thank you. We have some time for questions. I see some, but I will a little bit use of a priority or privilege of, and, and I just want to make one reflection which violate my own rule of no question is that that this inside and outside view is primarily distinguished by cognitive kind of differences. Right? People prefer inside view because well-constructed, detailed, clear scenarios, they seem more plausible. So if you paint a picture of more coal, cognitively it is assessable, right? And what is cognitively assessable? We assign very high probability because our brain is not very, very good for calculating, right? So here I just find, even though we use completely different messages, completely different terminology, I find that that, that illustrates the dangers of the inside view when you paint in huge details these very vivid but very implausible futures, right? Okay, now I take the questions. And there was three hands. I will start here. Thank you, that's a quite a refreshing presentation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, bearing in mind that you've used uh, other sources, which of course they're not perfect, so I don't know how controversial they are, but it's, um, I can see that the, the trend's definitely downward on the energy emissions. Um, I'm just wondering, because there seems to be kind of a lot of, um, a bit of a panic, you know, in, in, the, in the press and in, in some politicians about climate change, and if there's sort of almost a paralysis that's caused by this fear of, you know, an uncontrollable situation. If, uh, you know, if this view can actually provoke us more to just to take action and do the, do the necessary actions that are needed rather than worry too much about, yeah, I think that would be quite helpful. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of views here. One is that, that the, the role of scenarios and climate research is promotional in the sense that it's out there to try to get people to act in a certain way. Um, and there's another view that's out there that says that scientists should call things like they see them based on the best available evidence at the time and figuring out the politics, you know, is somebody else's job that we should hire them for. I think there's a middle ground there. Um, I, I am concerned, and we've seen this in the pandemic and elsewhere, that when, um, as we say in Colorado, when scientists or politicians get a little forward on their skis, um, it can actually damage public trust. So I think um, my sense is when I, and I've had a chance to give you know, versions of this talk around the world, um, 
I, I don't get a response from people that says, oh, we don't have to do anything. I often get a response that's more positive that, oh, this might be, in fact, a more manageable challenge and it's not all doom and gloom. So it, it's, you know, the politics and the science, I think we have to be able to, to talk about them separately, but, you know, no, no view of trying to convince somebody of this, that, or the other uh, who's in this presentation. This is just what the data show. Gunnar Luderer from the Potsdam Institute. Um, two questions. Um, you had these coal deployments. Yep. Um, and uh, did I understand correctly that these are baselines that you compared to the IEA CPS? Are you aware of the NPI um, and NDC type of scenarios where we also um, put in these existing policies and existing pledges? And then, like, would you expect the result to be different? Uh, second question. Well, let me, let me answer yeah. that while, yeah. while I'm thinking about it, because I have jet lag. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are, you know, one of the things to appreciate, and I mean, everybody knows this, is the scenarios forum. There are an enormous body of scenarios beyond the IPCC database, the NGFS scenarios now, and um, the, the EMF scenarios used in the US social cost of carbon. Um, you know, one good thing about this particular approach is people can pick whatever family of scenarios they want and plug it in. Um, I would be really interested to see how other scenarios conform, but the fact that, you know, today I showed you about 3,000 scenarios, um, and they all pretty much say the same thing. Um, I'd be surprised if there are scenarios that envision, for example, um, the, the decision by governments around the world to, to go back to coal, so. Those baselines are meant to be counterfactual, and I, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the second question, um, of course, like a scenario is so rich and has so many data points, it will always be wrong on some aspects. Um, how do you think, like, if you filter scenarios based on a very small window about things that might be right or wrong, how confident are you that this also tells you about the quality of the 2050 outcome? Yeah, so, so I mean, I, I think about the scenarios truly like a cone. They're not predictive. It's an intellectual space for crafting ideas about policy. And what we've done here is, is we have been agnostic as to the judgments made by the scenario developers. We, we, we're not second guessing those. So if, if the scenario community believes that the, the cone, that purple cone that we came up with doesn't represent all plausible futures, then my response is, well, go back to the lab and draw up some, some other ones that we can include there. Obviously, I mean, this is one of my frustrations with climate research. Obviously, we know a lot more about 2030 today than we did in 2005. And you know, the, the one big criticism of this approach here is that there are a lot of plausible futures that are, probably don't show up here because we haven't updated our thinking. And so that cone is probably bigger. Um, than we've thought, but that's a problem with the lag time in producing scenarios. It shouldn't be every seven years, every 15 years. We need to figure out how do we take an approach like the IEA every year and the climate science community has to adapt to the energy modeling community, not the other way around, would be my view. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope we continue discussion during the discussion. Let's applaud. Clever questions and clever answers. And the next is Teresa.